Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Chuan De Ding from Tencent Security Xuan Wu Lab, and there are my colleagues Wei Wei and Zhi Penghuo. So the call for paper asked us to submit a cutting-edge research, well, which is exactly what we did. So it's that easy. So this is our first time here at Black Hat. We are here to talk about internals and vulnerabilities of Microsoft's web browser. So we all work at Tencent as security researchers. Tencent is the largest social media and entertainment company in China. And to better understand the threat landscape and protect our user data and infrastructure, Tencent Security Xuan Wu Lab uh, focuses on applied security research in both software and hardware. In 2017, we participated in the Pound to Own contest and is the winner of Microsoft Edge category. Well, we also have prepared for Pound to Own 2018 to place in March this year. However, for regulatory reasons, we could not participate. Instead, we reported the vulnerabilities we discovered to MSRC. So this talk will be based on the versions of Windows 10 when, when, when the vulnerabilities were first discovered. In the next 50 minutes, we will first take a dive deeply into Microsoft Edge architecture internals. We will discuss the browser startup sequences and how Edge device and assign privileges. After that, an overview of Edge's IPC mechanisms. And finally, a detailed walkthrough of our bugs prepared for Pound to Own. Microsoft Edge is the default web browser on Windows 10. Microsoft says it is the faster, safer way to get things done on the web. It is a universal Windows platform app, and more on that later. It became one of the targets of the Pound to Own contest since 2016. Uh, Universal Windows Platform apps, or UWP apps, are built with Windows Runtime APIs, or WinRT APIs, which was introduced in Windows 8. WinRT is layered on top of Windows 2 API deals. From the security perspective, UWP apps run in a new type of sandbox called App Container. App Container introduces many isolation technologies, such as securable object restrictions, object namespace isolation, global atom table restrictions, enhanced UIPI, and network isolation. All these isolation techniques use the app container's load box token for access checking. The load box token was also introduced in Windows 8. It has three important logical members, integrity level, app container set, and capability sets. All UWP apps runs at low integrity level and has a unique set and a list of capabilities. Windows use these members to determine if an UWP app has access to resources, such as internet, microphone, or clipboard. For most UWP apps, one app container is enough. This is true for other pre-installed apps, such as Calculator, Maps, or OneNote. However, if an UWP app wants to further lock down the security, it can also create another type of app container called Child App Container. There are many operations that require permissions not available in an app container, such as reading or writing user files, or accessing the clipboard. So Microsoft Edge needs brokers for its privileged operations. This diagram illustrates the architecture of Microsoft Edge. The manager process, with process name MicrosoftEdge.exe, is responsible for managing the renderer processes and implements basic functionalities of the browser. The manager process runs in an app container. In fact, it is probably the only browser with, a, with its main process running in an app container sandbox. There are several different types of renders in Microsoft Edge. They are also called the content process, with process name Microsoft Edge CP.exe, and running as a child app containers of the manager process. <coughs> Browser broker, runtime broker, and shell infrastructure host all runs with normal user privilege. 
Therefore, they can perform privileged operations for Microsoft Edge. Uh, now we are going to talk about the startup. We are not going to cover every detail. What we really care about is what privileges are assigned to each edge process, especially the Internet AC. The manager process is the first started process. It's responsible for creating child processes. Let's see how it starts. Like traditional Win32 applications, double clicking or desktop shortcut starts the app. But instead of directly creating a new process, Explore the EXE sends the activation request to SI host the EXE. SI host gets the request and know to launch Microsoft Edge. And the activation request will be sent to RPC SS service. The RPC SS will use the activation information to create an app container process. Finally, a manager process is started by the RPC SS. Where does RPC SS get activation information from? The information isn't stored in registry. It's dynamically loaded only if needed. Activation information is stored in a packaged directory under program data. Each app's activi uh, activation information is stored in a subdirectory named by packaged full name in a file named activation stored that. The file would be loaded into registry through NT load KEX. The data structure uh, are similar with COM. For example, uh, to active Microsoft, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, the data, uh, data structure uh, similar with COM. For example, to activate Microsoft Edge, uh, we can look up the Microsoft Edge key under activable class ID. Here, the activation type is one, uh, which means out of process activation. The server value records the server name. We can get the executable path of the server by looking up the server name under the server key, which is Microsoft Edge the exe. Uh, after getting the activation information, RPC SS would start process creation. The most important thing of creating a container process is to create a low box token. First, a package seed could be calculated from the package family name. Second, get capability seeds for the process. Then, create a low box token. Finally, create a process with this low box token. Where does the capabilities come from? We know each UWP app has an APPX manifest XML, which defines the needed capabilities. And there are two special cases. The first one is the capability to access the package itself, generated by package seed to package capability seed. Uh, the second one is cellular data. It's a capability to access cellular network on our phone which was a Windows Phone feature. Now, it's content process time. Content process is a child app container process. There are many types of content process for different jobs. But their startup sequence are almost the same. Microsoft Edge would create content process with restricted name from 001 to 121 because it is also an app container process. It would send the creation request to runtime broker. Runtime broker will use the package seed and the capability seed to create a low box token, which is also called an, o an IC token here. Then it will transfer the token and the creation request to SI host. SI host will register the token with RPCSS and request it to active the app. Finally, a content process is started by RPCS. 
The token of child app container process is created in runtime broker. Runtime broker gets activation information from Microsoft Edge. For example, token of manager process and the restricted name. Then generates a new app container seed through a very long name function. Derive restricted app container seed from app container seed and a restricted name. Next, runtime broker gets the capability seeds from Microsoft Edge through COM callback and creates tokens for content process. The app, the app container seed is calculated from package file name used SHA2. In this uh, example, the manager process seed is at the top. The seed in the middle uh, is from the SHA2 of 001. The child seed is a combination of parent seed and the SHA2 of restricted name, which became the seed of Internet AC. Uh, the capabilities listed uh, on the here are child processes capabilities. They are not stored in registry. Instead, they are hard coded in edge binary. In this example, the child has capabilities to access location, printer, clipboard, and more. Child processes with restricted name larger than 071 will have two more capabilities. Uh, the private network client server and the enterprise authentication. Okay, whenever we try to find bugs for in a complex system, the first thing we need to do is looking for attack surfaces. This defines the directions and the scale of our research. Everyone knows IPC components are most available to privilege escalation bugs. So let's look at the IPC mechanisms used by Microsoft Edge. There are three types of IPC mechanisms used by Microsoft Edge, RPC, COM, and LCIE IPC. We will go over each one. RPC is an inter-process communication mechanism. It allows client and server to communicate over several protocol sequences, such as ALPC, named path, socket, and more, and many more. A server interface will be bound on an endpoint with a specified protocol. A client can access the interface with its identity. RPC server can use the security descriptor to control access permission of an endpoint. It can also use interface security callback function to check permissions of a client. There are many RPC servers in Windows. Some of them are accessible in an app container sandbox. One use case of RPC is a Microsoft Edge jet engine. The internet renderer sends JavaScript code to jet engine via RPC for compilation. The jet engine will reply with generated machine code. The second widely used IPC technology is COM. Windows uses COM to implement ActiveX control. Microsoft Office also uses COM to implement compound document. COM has become the foundation of Windows. It is widely used in Windows shell components and service components because it provides strong reusability, scalability, and isolation. There are two types of COM servers, in-COM, in-process COM, which are implemented in a deal, and out-of-process COM, which are implemented in an executable file. For the security perspective, we are more interested in out-of-process COM because they run in different security contexts and may have more permissions than app container. They opened up a large attack surface for sandbox process. <coughs> to launch or activate an auto-process COM server, the client's COM runtime will send a request to system activator that runs in RPCSS. 
RPCSS will force the check client's permission, then launch or activate the associated server. When the server starts, it will register its class and the interface information with RPCSS. Next, RPCSS will return the information back to client. The client can query more information about the server, such as the RPC endpoint. Finally, the client could directly communicate with the server via RPC. COM has defined multiple security settings in the registry. System-wide security settings controls the default launch and access permission and the core level capabil security capabilities for COM servers. Process-wide process security settings are supplied by COM server at runtime. Every COM local server can has its own FID key in the registry. There are two values in the key to define the launch and access permission. COM server can call co-initialize security explicitly to override the default permissions. Otherwise, the COM runtime will implicitly call it with registry settings during initialization. As we mentioned earlier, RPCSS is responsible for launching or activating COM servers. RPCSS checks if client has launch or activation permissions by calling launch or activation allowed function. Launch means create a new instance of a client server. Activation means create a new object on an existing server. Access permission is checked by COM runtime at the server side. The interface security callback function registered by COM server is used for checking client's permission. Microsoft Edge uses an auto-process COM server called AME Broker to create a dictionary and learn words. The third type of IPC used by Microsoft Edge is LCIE IPC. Loosely coupled IE was introduced in Internet Explorer 8. It isolates renderers from manager to improve reliability, perform performance, and scalability. Because LCIE IPC uses shared memory to simulate Windows messaging, it is also known as shared memory IPC. During the manager initialization, LCIE map IPC creates a named section through create file mapping. The renderer and the broker write to or read from the shared memory through our open file mapping. After sending a message, an event is set to notify the target of processes. There are three types of shared memories. Messages in trusted scope are trusted. There are others are untrusted. Renderer process has no permission to write messages into the trusted scope. In manager and the broker, sensitive functions check the message type. If a message is untrusted, it will not be handled. This prevents untrusted process from calling sensitive functions. A trivial use case would be renderer adding URL and file icon to manager's history. After each navigation, renderer will pack website URL as a LCIE message and send it to the manager. Manager gets the website URL from untrusted scope, then downloads its firewall icon, icon and adds them to history. Okay. Okay. It became the target of Pound One in 2016. Uh, most bugs used in the context are memory corrections, but we prefer logic bugs. We think they are more stable, more generic, and most importantly, lack of attention. Uh, in Pound 2017, we used a logic bug to escape the sandbox. We are the only team that used logic bug to for sandbox escape. Here is the vulnerabilities we use it in a contest. Browser broker. Browser broker is an important part of Microsoft Edge, and it is an out-of-process 
Com Solver, it runs in medium integrity level to perform operations that are not permitted in an app container. Things like launch an Internet Explorer instance, open a folder, and so on. The manager process would launch the browser broker with COM activation. Using CLSID browser broker, the manager process launches the server and gets an interface for access to the broker. A COM interface could be machined into an object RIF and pass it to another context. After the manager gets the interface, it would machine it to an uh, object RIF and send it to other processes with LCIE IPC. Object RIF is the name of structures of machined interface in COM. This is an example of a machined browser broker interface. Uh, it's a block of memory that starts with signature meow. <laughs> it's a standard object RIF. Its interface ID is a browser broker factory, and it has OX ID, OID, and IP ID. With all this information, it can be a machine back to an interface pointer in another context. When a content process starts, it would unmachine and get a browser broker interface. This is how COM interfaces are transferred between different Microsoft Edge processes. Here is the browser broker structure. Manager process launches and initializes a browser broker and sends the browser broker to each content process it launches. Content process can access the browser broker and co interface methods, but not so fast. Most of the methods has access checks to limit operations or child process can perform. Before we talk about the access check, here is a description of edge process integrity level. We know Windows has integrity levels such as low, medium, and high, and all app containers are low integrity. But in order to limit privilege, privileges even further, Edge also has its own integrity levels. This is related with restricted name. For example, the Internet AC process is integra integrity level is one, which means MRAC. Now let's go back to the access check. There are three different types of, uh, of access check. First is trusted AC only, which means only trusted app container could call. It's for privileges methods such as launch IE. Second is everyone. It basically means no access check. Third is all app container except 002. Methods like end credential use this. From attacker's perspective, almost every useful method would check for trusted AC. But what is trusted AC? Trusted AC it's not hard-coded. It's registered through request broker method. Manager process launches the browser broker and calls request broker to initialize it, which means trust AC is always, always the manager process. Request broker is used to register app identity information, such as app container seed, application name, and the location, it can only be called once by the manager process. So the content process couldn't call this method. Let's look at the browser broker design again. Uh, do you see something strange? Why should we follow the way uh, that is supposed to be used? The design assumes that the content process couldn't launch a browser broker. But is this really the case? By looking at the launch permission, you can see all application packages is allowed to launch and activate. In Microsoft's official document uh, implementing an app container, it says, 
to allow all our containers to access our resource and the all application packages seed to the ACL of that resource. Now, the vulnerabilities is very obvious. Although an internet rendered couldn't access sensitive uh, methods in the existing browser broker, amazing, um, amazingly, uh, it, it, it is allowed to launch a new browser broker. If the render then calls request broker with the internet AC seed, the internet AC uh, would become a trusted AC to this new broker, and the render could call almost all broker methods. Uh, sorry. Now we only needed to find a method to escape the sandbox. For example, we could call the launch IE method to launch Internet Explorer with control document, but there is an easier way. Uh, this method is called right class of category. It calls load the single possible SP frame deal for this process. From the name, we could know it loads uh, a deal into current process. It opens a hard-coded name to the op application directory to build the deal path. And guess what? The uh, application directory uh, global variable is also set through request broker during the initialization. Uh, so now we can load our custom deal into browser broker. <coughs> These are the steps. First, drop a custom e-modeled deal to a writable directory. Uh, next, activate uh, a new browser broker and request the broker with the internet AC seed and the writable directory picks. Finally, call the red cloth of the category method, and uh, we are out of the sandbox. How did Microsoft fix this? The launch permission of the browser broker has changed. Now, only the manager process is allowed to launch the browser broker. In fact, starting from Windows 10 RS2, restricted app containers are no longer allowed to access objects labeled with all application packages. Microsoft did this by adding a token attribute called no all application packages and introducing a new group called all restricted application packages. Is this the end? And guess who comes to rescue here? Adobe Flash. <laughs> Adobe Flash used to lead the way on the web for rich content, gaming, animations, and media of all kinds. It is pre-installed on Windows starting from Windows 8. Well, this is a brilliant design decision because it significantly reduced the time between user installs the Windows operating system and see a Flash-based ad. Last year, Adobe announced that Flash will no longer be supported after 2020, and will be replaced by HTML5. Adobe Flash Player was also in integrated into Microsoft Edge and enabled by default. To phase out Flash, Microsoft Edge started limiting auto-run. It implemented a click-to-run mechanism. It runs Flash Player in a special render called BC Host. As mentioned before, it is also a child app container. The internet render cannot access Flash, so attackers cannot exploit Flash vulnerabilities within web pages. With web pages. Same as uh, Microsoft Edge, Flash Player also needs its own broker to perform privileged operations. Flash Broker delegates privileged operations from Flash Player running in render processes. As a result, Flash Broker becomes another attack surface of Microsoft Edge sandbox. In fact, Microsoft has considered isolating Flash Broker when designing Microsoft Edge. That is why it runs Flash Player in a special render, and access to Flash Broker is also uh, strictly restricted. No render have launch or activate permission to Flash Broker, and only BC Host and local zone renders have access permission to Flash Broker's interface. So how can a render use the Flash Broker? 
This diagram, <laughs> this diagram shows the activation process of Flash Broker. Co-create instance is shimmed in the render process, and calls are relayed to the browser broker. The browser broker launches the Flash Broker and passes the interface back to the renderer. Then the renderer can access the Flash Broker with that interface pointer. Flash Broker supplies a lot of functions such as pop-up, file operations, GDI device access, etc. The most important thing is that it runs at median integrity level. In the last few years, there have been multiple vulnerabilities found in Flash Broker, but is it still insecure? We've discovered an interesting behavior. Adobe Connect is a software used for presentations, web conferencing, and desktop sharing. When user enters a meeting room created by Adobe Connect on a web page, Flash Player prompts the user to install an add-in. If the user then clicks the Yes button, Flash Broker will download and launch the add-in with median integrity level. In Flash Broker, functions with names start with Broker LM are used for downloading and uh, launching add-ins. They are called in this order, and for each add-in, a pair of files will be downloaded. First, it downloads a .z file. The compressed data block must start with the magic string Choi. Looks like the developer is making a reference to certain historical events when writing this piece of code. Before the magic string is a digital signature block, will be verified with the hard-coded certificate chain. Following the magic string is the uncompressed file size. Then it also downloads a .s file. It is also signed and holds a SHA-2 digit uh, of the uncompressed add-in. It is used for verifying adding at a later stage. All digital signatures of downloaded files are verified with the hard-coded certificate chain. This is the entire process of downloading and launching and adding. It, the Flash Broker only downloads files from the hard-coded domain markermedia.com. The adding can only be wrong when the signature of downloaded files are verified and the shard 2 of the adding matches the digest. Once it's downloaded and verified, it can run the add-in with controllable arguments. This makes the attack surface significantly larger. These add-ins may contain vulnerabilities or become unmaintained. So, as we, so all we need to do is to find as many add-ins as possible, then review them. If we can find bugs in these add-ins, we may break out of the sandbox. We found several add-ins and digest files on the Marco Media web server. Many of them are still have valid signatures. Some of these add-ins are built with the ancient Flash player and can open an SWF file via command line arguments. We can use known vulnerabilities to get code execution here. One of the add-ins is Marco Media Breeze. It is used for live communication and it has a built-in Flash player released in the year of 2003. ASLR, DEP, and even stack cookies only exist in academic papers at that time. So all we need to do is to find a 5,000-day exploit to get code execution in adding process. Do you miss that error? For most browser attack scenarios, the first step is always to get code execution in the internet renderer. Then export its privilege escalation bugs to escape sandbox. So how can we escape from the internet renderer? Let's look at what we already have. We can get our code execution in internet renderer. We can also escape sandbox from BC host renderer, our local zone renderer. What do we still need to build a complete exploit chain? We have two options. First, find a way to run JavaScript in BC host renderer. Second, find a way to get into the local zone. 
However, as we mentioned earlier, getting the BC host renderer still needs user confirmation. We cannot control the confirmation button within renderer. Finding a universal cross -set, set scraping bug is also not easy. So let's think about what we can do with code execution in the internet zone. When we try to navigate from internet zone to local zone, the console says the access was denied. This makes sense. Same origin policy forbids this kind of behavior to prevent cross-site cross information leakage. So where does the browser perform the zone check within Renderler? Let's dig into navigation internals. The navigation will happen when we visit a website through a address bar or click a hyperlink on a web page. Follow hyperlink two will be called, and Renderler will check the target URL. Microsoft Edge does a zone check within Renderler. If it determines the target URL needs to be opened in a new Renderler, the navigation will re the navigation request will be sent to the manager. Otherwise, it just redirects in the current Renderler. Manager will also check the target URL with redirection policy and determine the type of Renderler to use. A new type of page Renderler will be used for blank page, a local zone Renderler for local file, and a privileged Renderler for settings page. When navigating to local zone, manager will get the PSC from zone ID for target URL. Zone ID is calculated from target URL by calling IE get zone IURL function. Manager will create a new local zone renderer process with PIC 121 if target URL is in local machine zone, internet zone, or a tr trusted site zone. There are two security issues in the navigation. First, the zone check is completely done in the renderer process. We can navigate to a local page when current URL's protocol is failed. This can be bypassed with crafted data or request manager directly. Second, manager retrieves PIC from zone ID, which in turn is calculated from target URL. However, there is no additional check on file URL, and the local zone renderer's PIC is returned when target URL is a local HTML file. By abusing this, we can render a local HTML file dropped by internet renderer in a local zone renderer. <coughs> to exploit the SOP bypass, first, write a local HTML file into a temporary folder that can be accessed by local zone renderer. Then create an anchor element with that file as a source. We can locate the host URL where the anchor element and modified it began with file multiple protocol. Then we trigger a navigation where on click event. This bypasses the zone check and navigates to local zone. Let's put it all together. This diagram shows the entire sandbox escape. First, get code execution in internet zone. Then use, then use SOP bypass to navigate to local zone. Next, another code execution in local zone. Finally, we use a flash broker to escape the sandbox. Here is a demo video for the exploit chain. First stage, code execution in Internet Renderer. <coughs> Second stage, the SOP bypass to local zone, and we get the 
called execution again. Next, the flash broker bug, and we are out of sandbox. So however this box faced, for the flash broker bug, Adobe removed those vulnerable add-ins from micromedia.com. For the SOP bypass, Microsoft added a file integrity level check in IE get zone IUL. If the target file has a low integrity level label, it can only be opened in in internet zone. So to recap, we walked you through the security architecture of Microsoft Edge. By minimizing attack surfaces, Microsoft Edge is much more secure than its predecessor, Internet Explorer. By re-architecting the entire browser, new inter-process communication mechanisms are needed. We dived into these IPC mechanisms and interactions between processes and components. By abusing design flaws in these components and features, we were able to find two chains bugs for ex escaping the sandbox. So we just detailed a complete compromise of Microsoft Edge sandbox, logically. But why? Logical bugs are usually not come from trivial programming errors. They are bad design decisions from the very beginning. To find this, you must have a deeper understanding of the target software than the, those programmers that are actually working on it. It is a combination of programmer logic, hardcore operating system internals, reverse engineering, and creative thinking. The result is a bug chain that is stable across versions, 100% success rate, and simply fun to talk about. So we would like to thank Alex Ionescu and James Forshell for their excellent talks, papers, and code. We would also like to thank our lab director, Yang Yu, for, their, uh, for supporting our research. And thank you all for listening. Now it's question time. So uh, we will be releasing a white paper on Black Hat website later today. So if you have any further questions, you can also follow us on Twitter. Thank you.